looking up a stat on Wikipedia while you were talking. As of June 2017, 51% of the world's population has internet access. There you go. Now, that's good. Mm. But again, when you think about that, only half the world. Are they considering China in that? Well, last time I checked, it was part of the world. Not really. China is not really a part of the Western world. That's what but, stats really are interesting because like, if you take China out, which has the Chinese firewall, so they don't have Facebook, Google, they don't have anything that we have in the Western world. There's a Chinese equivalent, but they don't have a single one of our things because that would be illegal because Chinese aren't allowed to share their data with the Western world, basically. Do you know that? No. Yep. No Amazon, no, you know. Now, you raised an interesting point nothing. because I, obviously I'm just I'm vomiting out something I've read on the screen, right? So here's the, here's the State of the Union, as the Americans like to say. Yes. I've looked something up. I've Googled it. So I've given all my trust to Google, which is questionable. Yeah. Uh, bam, there's the answer. Well, if it's on the internet, it's true. Yeah, exactly. Say, like yeah. if it's published or you read it in a book <laughs> or see it on TV, it's true. Um, which country has the highest number of internet users? This showed up in the search that I just did. Guess which country has the highest number of internet users? What do you reckon? Ooh, per capita or just the highest number of internet users? You are just talking about them. Like per capita? Oh, it doesn't it's just. Oh, just the number. Top 20 countries with highest number of internet users, December 31st, 2017, with 1,283,198,970. Well, it would have to be China. It is. Well, yeah. That You're paying on the money. Now, it's an interesting. Imagine if that's not included in that stat. What, 8 billion people in the world? I'm 1. sure that particular stat, they probably are. Included. No, no, the earlier one I'm talking about. Yeah. 8 well, billion people in the world, 1.2 billion of them in China. Eight billion people, seven billion, surely. Really? Yeah, seven. Get your bloody surely. Google search out. I thought it was eight billion. How many people in Australia? Uh, 26. 24. 24. 24. 24.5, I How many people in America? Uh, 380, I think. Yeah, see, I round up 400 million. I mean, rounding up. So yeah, 7.2 billion people around the world, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening. 7.2. And I turn over 7.2 million. There's got to be wow. something in that number. 7.2 is the number, folks. That's true. Um, which country has the fastest internet speed? We're getting off track here, but this is fun. Oh, the fastest internet would have to be... Life's good. LG. LG, life's good. Where's LG from? Oh, come on, mate. Seriously? Am I that old? I don't know. Korea. Fastest internet speed in the world? South Korea. Um, we could have a show mm-hmm. of just quoting stats because this is just interesting. Yeah, How we, that? we started with books. We've gone to children in third worlds and now we're talking about just random stats off Wikipedia. But, yeah, no, that's right. That's fine. I really like that's where a- you were going to sort of really just bring the focus back. With the kids that you're funding, Yes, I love the thought that you put into that to say, you know, one day I'm going to have to make a decision when I give them a phone. Yes. But you're thinking about what you're giving. You're not. It's not the hardware you're thinking about. You're thinking about the opportunity that you can give them by giving them the hardware to access and connect. So how cool is that and how what a cool why is that? That's really cool. That is a cool why. That is a very cool why. It's, it's a lot cooler than profit and loss and balance sheets, which is the lifeblood of the company and the heartbeat. I get it. But like that is like tangible, something where you can feel good about yourself and go, yay. Because la- I don't know about you, but last time I checked, look at my bank account with zeros in it. Like, yeah, it's like it's better than none, but it's not like it gives you this – infinite feeling of achievement and wow, whereas I look at this beautiful picture of Laura Ramos from Mexico and I just go, that is the reason why Jackson Dean. We've got Mark. We've got Mark Masimbi. We've got Brian Birio. Shouldn't probably be saying their names, but there's a million I'm sure there's a million Laura Ramos is in Mexico, but anyway. Oh. But, yeah, I always get taught. What I get taught uh, by a mentor once this is a good quote. I'm trying to think of it. Uh, you can never be happy striving for more money because if your happiness is based on the amount of money you have, you will always be depressed because there will always be someone that has more than you. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah, if your level of happiness is dictated by how much money you have in your bank account, you'll never, it's impossible to be happy because there's always someone that have more than you. Plus, if you pin your self-worth or self-esteem or whatever it is to money, well, 90% of your life is going to be depressing because you end up, you always spend money. It always goes away. (laughs) My favourite saying is money comes easily and frequently. It does. Well, yeah. I don't mean that in the blase rich person speaking sense. 
I just mean like if you have that relaxed approach to it, it actually power of positive attraction. Yeah, well, I like. Uh, I'm lucky. I sort of earned a lot of money when I was very young. Well, you started trading at 13. Yeah, and I realized pretty quickly that I didn't care how much money I made. Oh, sorry, really- you weren't fulfilled by the amount of money you were making. Well, I realized pretty quickly that whether I made. I remember I had the exact same feeling when I was working for like 25 bucks an hour and I got like a paycheck. And then I remember a few times where I made like, I remember those huge dopamine hits. Like the first time you make like 15 grand, you know, in like one little transaction, Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, wow, that was pretty cool. (laughs) But then when you, when you earn six figures in a transaction, you see six figures drop into your bank account in a transaction, you're sort of like, it's weird when you get to that level, you just don't care anymore either, which is kind of, that's where it gets real weird where yeah, you're I like, I sort I of it. thought that that would be a huge moment of mine, but it was almost like an expectation at that stage. So like, you, yeah, I don't know, like I get more fulfillment and happiness. <laughs> I'm going to play the killer song. I am the man. Cause it's really what you're talking about, right? I'm the man. It's, and I don't mean that like you walk around like, fuck you, I'm the man. It's like, you get the sense of dopamine where you go, I've achieved something, but to actually try and recreate that, even when you're doing a six-figure, how long does it last? Tony Robbins will say, how long does it last? How long can you celebrate success for? What is success? Is it fulfilling? Yeah, well. You know the song, it's awesome. I'm the man by the killers. It's quite cool to be a man. It's quite uncool apparently to be a man today because we're so minimised. And that's a whole other <laughs> podcast on like women and the Me Too and all that flirting and blah, 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 blah. I don't want to trivialise issues, but I'm just saying this song made me laugh. The software behind YouTube. It's quite good, right? The artificial- We're talking about copyright. Uh, if you, we've just cut you away get, from an earlier cool, story. Get, you get copy striked on YouTube or you get yeah. on all the platforms. You go and play like a mainstream song. And I know. It did it to me. I thought I was copyright. making my video cool and I went, eh, you've used copyright material. Yeah, don't do that. You basically, yeah, it's so hard to put any like popular song you know, on anything. I was talking to Apra because I wanted to use Christina our new My Island Home is my favourite song. You know, My Island Home. And I was thinking I really want to use that in one of my marketing videos I did because we now go nationwide. And if you use less than 30 seconds, it's cheaper or something and then it's about the amount of times that it gets played. The formula to work it out, I'm still confused on as you can tell, but yeah, it's like, yeah, you've got to be very careful and even if you want to buy it, it's still very hard to work it out and do it even through APRA who's the regulator for this stuff. Right. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, I thought there might have been a comment coming back from that, but there wasn't. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's <laughs> copyright on YouTube. You had to dry <laughs> yeah. but no, look- I don't know. I, I've, I've actually never looked into like trying to buy stuff that's copyright. I just... I'll just go and find the instrumental or like a free version of yeah. it. I'm not really at that level where I'm like, I need that song. Like I need to spend $20,000 on getting licensing that song. It's like, mm. no, <laughs> mm. I'm just going to keep the $20,000 and find an find instrumental. I'm Nicky Christian. I'm here with Jackson Dean, the owner of Social Growth Media. We've talked today about what books do we read or listen to. I will recommend some books since you're, Brought it up. I don't necessarily read them, but if you want to learn how to do public speaking, read the TED Talks book by Chris Anderson. That's a pretty good book. All right. So yeah, that's for you, Nikki. You need TED to read, Talks by Chris Anderson. You read that one. Creator um, of TED. If you just need a general book to read, like that, you need to have. You absolutely need to have. I would say Tribe of Mentors by Timothy Ferris or Tim Ferris, as he's more widely known, so I'm not sure was why it, he it, put Timothy on I don't on know there. that. Wasn't his first book, because I've got the first book, and I'm just trying to think what it's called. Was it um, Random Collection of Titans or? Um, Tools of Titans. Tools of Titans. I've got that on my bookshelf at home, yeah. So it's the same thing. Too. It's just, Tools of Titans and Tribe of Mentors is the same thing. It's just Tribe of Mentors is more updated. Okay. It's just this year. So that's the absolute recommendation I would say there. You've just reminded me, the four-hour work week from Timothy Ferris. Yeah. I read that. Oh, I think it's about 10 years ago, I'm guessing. Yeah. And at that stage, I made a decision to go, you know what? I'm actually going to get my company set up to the point where I don't have to work so I can retire and work less than four hours a week. Yeah, no. Well, I did it. <laughs> I, I did it. You I did it at the age of 40. four hours a week. Well, 
in the company that most people are like the thing that I created that turned 7.2 million, yeah. I got it set up to the point where it was so streamlined and automated that I actually was working less than four hours a week on that company. Kidding. And I've never actually stopped to ponder and connect the dots where I now remember reading the four hour work week going, fuck yes. Why would I want to spend 40 hours in something when I can actually get something honed down to the point where I can then move on from that? It, that's not the whole reason I got there, but I'm, it's funny now that we're just talking about it. That was actually one of the f- little s- sort of pebbles in my shoe that kept annoying me and sort of helped me move to the point of streamlining so I could retire at 40. I'm 42 yeah. now. I retired at the age of 40 and then went back to work in the business two years later because I nearly lost it all, but that's another story. Yeah, and I think it's like it's a good book. It's just I think it's not really about creating a four-hour work no, week. It's no, about no. the idea of automation and automation, outsourcing. Automation and outsourcing, yeah. And that's a good concept. But as we know, we're having firsthand experience in offshoring, outsourcing, automation, living in the third world, managing uh, decent-sized Philippine teams and so forth. It's it's a little more challenging than, than the book makes it out to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about outsourcing um, – and it, we really have to devote a whole episode to that, and we won't do that here. But no. if you are in the middle of, if you've already undertaken your outsourcing journey and you're on the path to it and you're doing it, I would say make sure you've got a good local in country partner, yeah. uh, someone who can deliver what um, they're aiming for, and then someone who can manage the team that you've got in country. Don't think you can do a FIFO management job because it's just not going to happen. It's very hard. It's mm. like almost almost impossible. Yeah, I like this format. We could come up with so many different shows here. I think reading the stats one's the best because we could just literally sit here. We try and beat each other on stats and just guess stats, yeah. and that is really informative. If you're listening, where's this one going? This going on your podcast? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, this is joint content, so I just like the, look the the point about reading books. And the point why I said, "Hey, I just want to ask you one more question." Yeah. Before we wrap it up for the day, because it's in the afternoon now. People have told me my whole life that I have to read books. I'm saying to my 14-year-old son, Xavier, you've got to read books. He doesn't want to read a fucking book. He's happy playing Fortnite. Like, <laughs> he's happy being dig- a digital nomad, right? Digital uh, native, yeah. sorry, not yeah. a nomad. And I'm thinking, hmm, is the advice that we're giving people wrong? Should we, do we have to read? But And I think I've worked it out. It's not the fact that we've got to read the book or listen to the book. I really, what I'm really saying to my son is I want you to be curious and I want you to go forth and seek the information in, and get it in your own mind and make your own decision on it. And I think when we read a book, that's really what we're doing. When you and I talk, that's the discourse of sharing information, right? And that's really what a book is. The person writes the book to share a story, a good writer, yeah. and they want to let, let you in on a secret. They want to let you the secret source of what they've done or how. And I think that's why I secretly grieve that I don't read enough books because it's just about curiosity. Yeah, well, I like your approach. Why do you? Who says you have to finish a book? I mean, yeah. I pick up a book. And go shit. This is a lot of. Am I going to finish this? Can I fit it in? Will I commit? Will I say? I, I have all those thoughts. When yeah. I pick up a book. Well, it doesn't necessarily work. Every, everyone's different. Everyone's wired differently. Like I, I think we're growing up in a different generation of attention spans now as well. Yeah. For example, listening to the podcast on the go while you're commuting or while you're working. You're sort of getting two things done at once. Whereas when you're reading a book, I know that you get more immersed in the book. And if you like reading, you like reading. It's just as simple as that. If you don't like reading, I don't think you like reading. My wife reads every night before bed. Yeah, some people love reading. I I don't. And um, that's okay too. I've got some pretty decent life results without reading at all. Like I've literally read probably definitely less than 10 books in my entire life. Oh, if you don't include textbooks. Since I like, seriously, I f- was forced to read textbooks, obviously through uni through and all uni, that. Yeah. But if you don't, what, what's count the qualification those, you you got? So I got a bachelor of commerce, double majored in finance, entrepreneurship, and something else. Then I got accredited derivatives advisor level one and two, which is like the highest level in Australia for derivatives. Um, if you know what derivatives are, Google it. <laughs> uh, a derivative is 
Well, since I am qualified at the highest no, level, no, I should probably, be able, <laughs> should probably be able to explain it. But no, that's the, that's the art of explaining complex things, is in explaining complex things in a simple way. A derivative is something that derives its value from something. That simple. That's what a derivative is. So in the context- What's the universe? Sort of. No, no. <laughs> something that derives its value, value. from something. So a derivative- uh, well, the ones that I would trade, which is financial derivatives, is just literally an asset that derives its value from a different asset. So you have like a an options contract that derives its price or its value from something else, which would be a share. So like options that derive its value from shares or futures contracts that derive its value from shares. Which is all bullshit and it's all speculation. Of course it is. <laughs> But what you want to can do you tell is, I'm a property what, investor? What you want to what you want to learn is how to speculate in the right direction and make money in the in the right way. Wouldn't it be better just going red or black. Well, that is that is a true thing. I mean, unless you are professionally mm. trading and you are professionally trained mm. in the art of trading, which is actually eighty percent mindset and discipline of that mindset and following a strategy and doing it correctly. 80% of successful trading is that 20% is knowledge and strategy and mathematics and like how it all works. 80% is just managing your mindset around sleeping at night. Like, you know, you put on a trade and you, you've had the strategy and you've executed it perfectly. And then you wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat going, Oh, maybe I should sell that thing. You know, like that's the mindset game of trading. So it's like, at the end of the day, unless you are professionally trained as a professional trader. The little voice that goes, are you sure you know what you're doing? Exactly. I would say that, yes, trading is red or black. Like there's there's either professional training and professional trading around that or there's red or black. Because if you just half-heartedly go in and trade and invest, there's a very high chance it's a red or black decision. So and, but then it goes no different to property, man. No, like, exactly. Property is the same thing. Like how much research actually goes into a buying decision of a property? Mm. Like how many hours have mm. you accumulated on that one buying decision, right? And in the share market, it's the mm. same thing. Like you, if you were going to buy a $500,000 allotment of shares in one transaction, and this is why share trading will always kill property in the diversification argument. Because when you buy a house, you're 500 grand betting on one decision. Yeah, Whereas but I can in, see it. I can touch it. Yeah, you I can, can see and, and touch kick, shares kick, too. Kick the, t- the tap. You can see and touch shares as well. What, some you can go get your share certificate. Paper printed off someone's computer. Hang on a minute. What's a property actually? Is it a piece it's of built. paper? It's a title? Lend? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can see the building. Well, actually, what's a share? What's a share? A share of the asset. Yes, and an asset is whatever the asset is. So I can actually buy shares. In the diversification argument, you have $500,000 betting on one choice, one decision, one That's asset. True. And you're locked in, it's not mobile. You're locked in, no liquidity, can't get in and out. Whereas with shares, you could take the same five hundred grand, go and invest it in 10 different shares at $50,000 each, same type of upside, 10 times less the risk in my opinion. So you're a derivatives trader. Mm-hmm. So if I had two hundred thousand dollars, was a derivatives okay. trader. But so uh, we should do like a seven day challenge. If I gave right. you two hundred grand, yeah, what could you turn that into in seven days? All right, beautiful question, and one that we would get often. And I will answer it with an analogy. Okay. If you give me a thousand dollars, I don't need two hundred thousand. If you give me a thousand dollars today. I will give you back $10,000 on Friday, guaranteed. Would you like to participate in that trade? Yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, all I need- I'm I'm sitting here with my ass puckering going, but here comes the but. Okay. All I need you to do is take a boogie board bag to Bali for me. (laughs) Don't ask what's in it. You don't need to know. Oh, it doesn't Chappelle, matter. Chappelle. It doesn't matter. 
I'm, I told you, guaranteed, you give me $1,000 today, I'll give you $10,000 on Friday. All you got to do is take a big bull bad belly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lesson in risk and return. And it is specifically said in that order for that reason. You should always you analyze didn't disclose all the, the information risk. at the start. And I should have asked you more questions. Exactly. And so I'm answering your question with that analogy. If you gave me $200,000 today, how much could I give you back in seven days? Mm-hmm. Well, that would depend on the level of risk I would like to take with that two hundred grand. Mm. If you want me to bet, no, and I'll show you a few different scenarios here. If I invested that in shares, mm-hmm. you've got shares that are extremely high risk, mm-hmm. penny stocks that mm-hmm. might go up 50, 50% in the week. Or you got blue chips, which are probably going to go up 0.2% over that week, right? Or that's like that's like one kettle of fish when it comes to risk. It's just buying shares and just having highly risky shares. What if I did the following? I went and bought foreign exchange futures contracts that had 100 to 1 leverage. So instead of me having $200,000, I just leveraged it up to 20 mil, Right. I take that 20 mil on a margin loan inside the futures contract. I'm screwed if that guy says. Right? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm just trying to make the most money possible. All right? And then the, the foreign exchange pair that I'm betting on just happens to have a huge economic announcement this week, right, hang that on, will affect what, the- what, what do you know that you're not telling me? <laughs> that may affect that currency pair by a movement of, say, 2% in foreign exchange- well, I stand to make $20 million out of that trade. You know why? Because I'm leveraged. I've got risk where I stand to go like $20 million in debt as well. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, if you are ever going to invest, think risk and then return. And nobody thinks in that order. Nobody thinks in that order. And that's the, that, is, it, that, that by itself is enough to become a professional investor. If you think about everything in life. And I'll actually stand this back. You'll, this, this brings out why I'm actually very good at business at such a young age is because everything that I do in a business is investing. I'm literally investing a certain amount of money into an employee yep. that has a certain skill set that's going to deliver a certain product that's going to have a certain return on investment. You're leveraging. That's it. So I just believe that instead of trading where you've got I mean, I still do trade and invest, but just nowhere near the level I used to when you're running a hedge fund. You have a different level of you know skin in the game. But nowadays, technically, I'm still running a hedge fund. It's just my fund of money is getting deployed in different types of assets, which is employees and software and strategies. And all of them have a certain associated risk and return on investment.